And welcome everyone to another episode of Smart Money Circle. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Ben Wolf, who's the president and CEO at Paladine AI. Ticker symbol is PDYN. Ben, thanks so much for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Thanks for having me, Adam. So Ben, I always like to begin. Can you please tell us your story and how you got to where you are today? Sure. So as you pointed out, I run Paladine AI, which is a publicly traded company focused on artificial intelligence for industrial robots and drones. Um, the company has a long history in the robotics space uh, that was actually formed way back in the 1980s and started doing work on humanoid robots. It was one of the very first companies to work on humanoid robots, did a lot of work with the Department of Defense in the 90s uh, and early 2000s. And we started building a wide variety of machines that were used by NASA and DOD, exoskeletons for soldiers, just a wide range of really complex, cutting edge industrial robots. Um, in 2007, Raytheon bought the company and it became the defense uh, focused robotics division of Raytheon. Uh, in 2014, I started talking to the company and the management team about doing a management buyout. And in 2015, I partnered with the management team to do that, to buy, to, to buy the company from Raytheon um, and to turn the focus, pivot the focus to turn our industrial robots that we've been working on for defense applications into uh, dual use so that we could use them both for commercial customers and for the DOD. And so we raised money over the years, spent a lot of time trying to, to commercialize these really complex, challenging machines, uh, unlike anything that anybody had ever done before. And we learned a lot over those years. Um, in 2021, we went public through a merger with a SPAC, uh, through what's called a DSPAC transaction, uh, raised some money. And at that point in time, I retired. Um, I had uh, told all of our investors along the way that I was not interested in being a public company CEO again. I had already done it three times and uh, loved running a private company, but was not really into being a public company CEO again. So we brought in a new management team um, and, uh, and the team grew significantly. And they spent the next couple of years really doing everything they could to try and commercialize the robotic systems that we were trying to bring to market. Unfortunately, it proved to take longer and cost more than anybody had expected. Uh, and as a result, the company started running low on capital. Uh, and I started talking to the board about ways that we could try and uh, recreate some of the shareholder value that we had lost. And one of the things that became clear to me was that we had developed within the company an incredible artificial intelligence platform. Originally, it was designed to be used on the robots that we were building ourselves. But what we came to realize was that there was a huge opportunity to use this AI for robots across a wide variety of different types of robots, not just our own. So earlier this year, I agreed to rejoin the company as president and CEO, uh, and we pivoted once again to focus exclusively on our AI for robots software platform. And we basically put on the shelf or in the freezer all of our hardware development efforts, skinny down, got very focused, cut our burn significantly, extended our financial runway. And now we are in the process of bringing to market this AI platform for robots. Wow, I love it. What, a, what an incredible story. So you're taking AI for robots. Is that going to be for military application or is it for all applications or where does that go? It, it's both. Um, our, our AI platform is currently being tested by the Air Force. We've issued a couple of press releases about the success we've had there. Uh, it has equal applicability on the commercial side. So think of it as kind of a, a, a two product company at this point. One product is specifically focused on big industrial armed robots and cobots, which you see in manufacturing and logistics and things like that. Obviously, both the Defense Department and commercial entities have the same kinds of challenges when it comes to automating some of these tasks. And then on the other hand, we have a product that is designed for drones. And that is primarily a military product, but there's definitely application in commercial uses for inspecting infrastructure and doing things like that with drones. So uh, two different products, one's called Paladine IQ, which is for the commercial robot side, and then uh, Paladine Pilot, which is used for drones. I love it. And let's talk about the actual, the TAM, if you can, the total addressable market. I know, I can imagine it's ginormous. It's any military in the world can use it, industrials, any in industry can use it by all means. Yeah. So when you think about it, there are literally millions of robots in the workplace today doing tasks um, that are highly repetitive in nature. And what our software does is it allows those robots to be far more agile to be able to think more the way humans do, which means they can deal with complex activities. So if you have variations either in the environment or in the objects being manipulated, 
we can now enable these robots to do a lot more than they could before. So what's the TAM? I think it's, you know, it, it's in part all of the millions of robots that are already deployed in the workplace today. And then it's all of the millions of robots that are to be deployed. And obviously, you know, the big driver for automation today, it's not just about reducing cost and increasing quality and reliability. It's also the fact that we have fewer and fewer people willing to do blue collar jobs that are kind of dull and tedious and even dangerous. And so it's the confluence of these factors that, you know, fewer people in the workforce want to do these jobs, millions of jobs that are being unfilled. And as a result, we have to figure out as industry industries. How do we start filling these jobs with machines? And we think that our software is a way to make that happen. I love it. No, it makes perfect sense. Okay, Ben, next question for you is how do you handle risks? Please talk to us a little about risk management and what are some lessons you've learned and how do you, you know, reduce, mitigate risk and all that fun stuff? You know, when you're when you're bringing a brand new product to market, there are a ton of risks, right? There's, there's I like to think of it as two different categories of risk. One, you've got the technical or product risk. Um, can you actually make the thing work the way you envision it should and in a way that it will delight ultimate customers? And then you've got market adoption risk. Um, and and you know, will customers, even if you get the product right as you envisioned it, will customers want to pay for it? Are they going to be willing to adopt it? Will they adopt it fast enough? What will the sales cycle look like? You know, so there's a whole kind of commercial risk in addition to the technology risk. Um, and I think that's, look, any tech startup has to deal with those two risks. And obviously most investors think about those two risks and how do they, how do they evaluate those risks? In our case, um, you know, we're, we're mitigating the risk on the technology and product side because first of all, we've been at this for decades, meaning we've we've got this deep bench of knowledge about robotics. If we were a handful of really smart PhD students that had just come out of school working in a garage somewhere, we simply couldn't do what we're doing. It is lessons learned over decades uh, that allows us to be able to come up with this very novel approach to AI. Um, and so I think that's 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 a significant thing. You got to have a leg up. You know, if you're going to be competitive as a startup, particularly against these really well-funded huge companies. One, you gotta you gotta find a strength or a leg up that gives you something that differentiates you and increases your odds of success and mitigates that risk. So in my case, my company's case, I think it's our deep bench strength in our technology area. Um, so I think that has helped to mitigate a lot of the risk associated with bringing the product to market. Uh, and on the commercial side, you know, one of the things that we're really very focused on is working with large marquee customers that have needs that we can meet and developing close relationships with them so that ultimately they become our advocates in the marketplace. You can't spend, there's no amount of money that a startup can spend in my view um, to try and convince customers that you've got a better mousetrap. You gotta show it to them and, you, and that can only be done by building relationships. Right, no, there's no question. So yeah, it's not even build a better mousetrap. That's not the objective because it's a different world. You can't, you, like you said, the, the other people, the competitors are just way, way, it's a different world. Okay. I love that point. Now, timeless lessons. So you've accomplished a lot, CEO of several publicly traded companies. You've, you're top of the game now. What are some timeless lessons you've learned that you'd like to share with the audience in the market, in business, in life, anywhere you want to go? I'll tell you, number one is it always gets down to the people. Uh, I mean, if you're leading a company or a team, um, you're only as good as the people that you've got working with you. Um, and one of the lessons that I've learned is make decisions more quickly about people. Uh, promote people faster if they're really good at what they do. Um, give them all the tools they need. As a leader, your primary job is to clear the brush out of the way for your people to be able to accomplish their objectives. Similarly, on the flip side, make a decision about somebody that might not be the right fit and counsel them in a way that either gets them to, to a, a different place in your company or outside of the company that's a better opportunity for them. Um, one of probably my biggest weaknesses is uh, that I've learned over the years is just not making those decisions fast enough. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, because it's almost like you're trimming the fat, so to speak. If somebody's weighing you down, you got to either get rid of that anchor or that weight so you can keep moving forward or just reposition them so yeah. it's not. And, 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 you know, as a startup, we always have limited resources. I don't care how much money you've raised. You're always you've got competition for your resources. And when you think about it, our teams in a, in a startup are kind of like the teams on a professional sports team, you know, like an like NFL team. You know, yeah. NFL teams are not shy about trading out players to increase the quality of their play and trying to meet their objective. So right. I would say that's 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 one of the big lessons. Another big lesson is you got to believe um, yeah. as a leader, you and your team have to believe that you can accomplish something. And one of the one of the things that my team gets tired of hearing me say is no NFL team ever won the Super Bowl going into it thinking they were going to lose. 
Um, you know, you have to believe no matter what, what the stats say, no matter what the odds are against you, you got to believe and you got to be passionate. Otherwise you're not going to get there. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. That is so powerful. So, uh, wait, so we, a funny line similar to that is you got to buy what you're selling. Otherwise no one else is going to buy it. So, <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about timeless mistakes, Ben, what are some timeless mistakes you've made or you've seen other people make and how do you avoid them? Oh, I think in the startup world, uh, there's a couple of things. Number one is um, if you're leading a company, make sure you've got a great board of directors. Um, you don't always have the luxury of deciding who your board is going to be. Uh, but especially when you bring in venture capitalists um, or other smart financial people, um, one of the things that I've seen hurt more, more startup companies than anything else is not having people that are on your, on your board that truly understand your business and truly have the best interest of all shareholders at stake, not just their own interests. Um, and that's not intended to be a broad indictment of the venture capital industry. It's just a, a statement of facts, you know, competing interests in the boardroom, um, not really understanding, being in the weeds of the company, that can really hurt a company and it's not helpful to a CEO at all. So I think having a great board is one of the one of the single most important things that you can do. Um, I, and I think another lesson learned um, is be really judicious with your cash. Never, ever assume you've got more money than you need. Um, and it doesn't matter if you've just raised money or if you're running low on money, whatever it is, get everybody on your team to rally around the fact that you have to be judicious with your shareholders' resources. Right. That's very powerful. So what makes a great leader, Ben? Let's talk about leadership. Anywhere you want to go in that world. You know, I think one of the most important things as a leader is what I referenced before is your ability to attract and retain great talent. There's no company, I don't care who the CEO is. I don't care if it's Elon Musk. I don't care who it is. You've, you're only as good as the team you've got because a single individual never grows a company on their own. Um, right. And I think the single most important thing that a leader does is identify, attract, and retain great talent. Oh, I love that. That is so powerful. So uh, what are some, let's talk about adversity. Every great successful company deals with adversity, overcomes adversity, same with great CEOs. How do you handle adversity? What are some obstacles that you've had to overcome? Uh, you know, I, I like the analogy about the way diamonds are made. You know, it's create, it's a, it's putting a ton of pressure on coal. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, I, I live by that. Um, I do my best under adversity when there's a lot of pressure. I think our teams do often the best when you've got a, a big audacious goal in front of you that seems insurmountable, seems difficult to achieve, and you pull the team together and you do it. I think getting everybody on the same page can be a challenge, particularly in a um, tech company where you've got very strong opinions on the product side, on the engineering side, on the R&D side, um, on the commercial side. And those opinions are not always aligned. And getting everybody rowing in the same direction at the same speed in the same, in, in the same boat is a really big deal. And that's, uh, that's something that I have not always done the best at, uh, and, and what I continue to try and improve on. I love that. So let's talk about the best final question for you, best advice you'd like to give the audience or your 30 year old self. <laughs> um, my 30 year old self, uh, I'll pick that one. Um, I think I started, running my first company as a public company CEO when I was 35 or 36. So pretty close there. I would say um, be more patient, uh, you know, pick your battles. And um, first and foremost, as a public company CEO, don't, don't, don't focus too much on the stock price on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, that, that first gig that I had as a CEO, we had a, we'd just gone public and then the great recession hit. Uh, oh, wow. And I watched my stock price over a period of nine months decline from something like 25 down to six. And I felt personally uh, guilty about that every single day. And I'll tell you, it was really hard for me to pick my head up and see what was going on in the world around me. I was so focused on trying to deliver for my shareholders. And, you know, that's what I, and when I invest in companies, I want a passionate CEO that cares more about his shareholders or her shareholders than about themselves. Uh, but I took that to an extreme and it, and it was an unhealthy place to be. So what I would say to my 30 year old or 35 year old self is um, take it easy, take it a little easier. Don't lose the passion and focus, but, but realize there are things that are beyond your control, particularly when you're dealing with public markets. I love it. Well, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time. Investors can learn more, ticker symbols, PDYN and, or visit your website. I'll have all that in the description links below. And hopefully Ben will have you on again soon. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you for your time.